Good afternoon, everyone. We've been noticing that I say good afternoon, and then when you leave, it's good evening. So uh, times are changing, aren't they? So good to have you all with us. It's uh, You're at Calvary Chapel of El Paso, and we welcome you. Those of you that are here, we ask that you would please stand and if you're able. And those of you that are watching on, uh, on the live stream platforms, we also welcome you to our service this evening. Would you please join us in a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful and so blessed to have this opportunity to come and to lift up our voices to you in praise and thanksgiving to the God of our salvation, to the God of our very lives that has given us breath and, and purpose and meaning. And, and today you're able to receive from us, Lord, the gratitude that we have in our hearts for all that you've done for us, and we're thankful to, to offer it to you today in praise, in uh, fellowship, to offer it in prayer, and in the time of uh, learning and growing in your word. Thank you so much, Father, for all that you have done for us, and Lord, we, we couldn't thank you enough. You're worthy of all that we are and all that we have. And we offer ourselves to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Heavenly Father, may that be true, that every day of our lives that we would just continue to recognize your hand at work in and through us. Lord, that we would recognize that every good and perfect gift has come from you. Lord, that none of us deserve any of the gifts that we've been given, and yet in your grace, your mercy, and your love towards us, you continue to pour out blessing upon blessing upon each and every one of us. Lord, even in the midst of of some of the most trying and difficult times, that you continue to bless our lives, you continue to watch over us, to guard us, to protect us, and also to lead us and guide us. And so this evening, we give you all the praise, glory, and honor. We thank you for all the work that you continue to do in our lives. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to speak to our hearts, or that you would anoint us afresh and anew with your Holy Spirit, that that we would truly be able to know your will, your guidance, your direction for our lives in everything that we do, everything that we say, everywhere that we go, even beyond the walls of this church. Lord, that you would be exalted, that you would be honored and glorified in our lives. And so we commit ourselves unto you, and we ask and pray all of this. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. You all may be seated. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name.
praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're so worthy. You're worthy of our praises. And you're worthy, Lord, of every, of every hallelujah that we can sing. And we are so blessed, Father, uh, to come into this place tonight. To do just that. To give honor and glory to you. To the one who is worthy. The one who is seated on the throne. The one who has no beginning and no end. The one who has loved us with an everlasting love. And we're so grateful, Lord, to have the opportunity, Lord, to be in fellowship with you tonight as well as with our brothers and sisters here and those that are watching as well. We're thankful, Father, that you are a God that is greater than all greater than all of your creation. While there are many still to this day that are blinded to that, we pray, Father, that in these last days that you'll open many, many eyes before, before the approach of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, before he comes. We pray, Father, that we will give testimony, Lord, to the wondrous things that Jesus has done for us and for them. And so, Lord, we are before you now to hear from you. May your word speak to our hearts, we ask. To the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel. We'll take a moment before you're seated to say hello and greet those around you. Maybe you can wave at them or do whatever else. Good evening. Wow, it's really hot. Uh, just a few brief announcements. Um, the first one, uh, some of you may know Neva and Richard Aguayo. Um, Neva passed away last Sunday, either shortly after or, or right around the time of the Sunday morning service. And so please continue to be in prayer for the Aguayo family. They have uh, several family members that have flown into town and the memorial service is gonna be held tomorrow, or actually Monday, I'm sorry, Monday at noon, and it will be right next door at Mount Carmel. So if you would please just keep the family in your prayers, for those of you especially that, that know the Aguayos, if you would please just continue to support them and, and you can attend, uh, as I said, Mount Carmel on Monday at noon. Um, the next thing is, Early voting has already started in Texas. Um, I've seen a few people that have mentioned that they've already gone out and they voted, and the lines are, are very, very small, and so it takes no more than about 10, 15 minutes. So we would encourage you all to take advantage of that opportunity. And to that end, there are some election guides out in the foyer, and they are in English on one side and Spanish on the other. It does not tell you who to vote for, okay? We're not trying to tell you, you shall vote for this person, otherwise you're going to hell, okay? That was one of the comments that I received after Sunday night last week, that how dare you, we're gonna to go to hell if they didn't vote the way you vote. That is not what I'm saying at all, and that's not what these papers tell you. What these papers do is they go through a number of the, the key issues, pro-life judges, reduction of police funding, school choice, including private schools, traditional marriage protections, federally mandated health care, the Iran nuclear deal, religious conscience protections, tax-funded abortions, Second Amendment, which is the right to bear arms protections, and the Green New Deal to eliminate oil and coal. And it goes through the presidential, the Senate, the congressional district, uh, both of those congressional districts, and it just tells you the two main parties, uh, the candidates for each of those parties, and where they stand. Do they oppose or do they support? And it has some supporting information at the bottom. So it is there just for your general information. Please take advantage of that opportunity. Um, as we've been mentioning the last couple of weeks, if you do have questions, if you do disagree, um, I thank you for those of you that have reached out via social media and via email to, to share your disagreements and to have 
civil discussions about it. I think that that's good. Anytime that we stop having a discussion about things, I think that, that we ruin everything. And so thank you both to those that have voiced your support and also to those that have voiced uh, a difference of opinion. And I would encourage you to continue to do that, to search out, to really, really get to know the facts. Don't just take my word or anyone else's word for it, but really get to know the facts yourselves. And if you do have questions, or you have concerns, you have comments, please reach out to us. You can email me directly, sean at calvarychapelopaso.com, or you can reach out to us via social media. So thank you very much. Okay. Before we begin our study, I wanted to share something with you all that uh, I think all of us have a, a concern about. Uh, you know, we've recently seen a spike on a spike in uh, COVID uh, activity, and here in El Paso, uh, rising. Uh, number of people, a lot more people are going uh, hot to hospital, you know, to, uh, because of it. And I think that, um, you know, we need to always take that very seriously. I think we have to be well uh, aware of what's going on. I think that, um, you know, we, we're, we're wise people. God made us to be wise to do the right things that we need to do, you know, to keep ourselves uh, certainly clean, washed, and, and so on and so forth, using, you know, whatever means necessary. I don't appreciate sometimes the way that our own city and county health officials seem to be always making it seem like we're the ones that are making all the mistakes. We, you know, COVID is a problem. The, the COVID-19 virus is, is something that we're still trying to figure out how and what it is. You know, I've considered it to be a, a very manipulated type of a thing, but, you know, aside from all of that, it's still a problem, and we still have people uh, close to us, uh, many of us, uh, uh, that have uh, been affected by it. So we certainly want to keep them in our prayers, and we want to do the right thing in, in uh, how we approach that. But I also feel that it is necessary for us, as believers in Jesus Christ, to know what God has said in, uh, in his word. And uh, a, f a dear friend of mine that uh, uh, lives in Wisconsin sent this out in, on Facebook, and I saw it this morning, and I thought, you know, I, I need to share this with, with you all. And it's just a picture of a, a silhouette of a girl looking out. I think it looks more like in France than any place else. But looking out a window, and underneath the picture it says, COVID-19 is not your enemy. Fear is. You will not die one day sooner or one day later than God has planned for you. But he did not create you to live in fear. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I think that every believer in Jesus Christ needs to always come back to that, come back to those things that, that God wants us to be in this time in this uh, era that, we, that we're that we facing. And I, and I uh, just encourage you all, you know, to uh, take that opportunity to search the scriptures. You know, we have since the beginning of, of the uh, lockdown and, uh, and all the things that have happened over these many, many months, always focused on the very fact that uh, we have a God that's greater than COVID-19. But he's greater than all of the diseases that we have to face. And there's a lot of them. And, and so, you know, we, we uh, need to remember what God has placed us on this earth for, what he's placed us on this earth to do, to be a light, to be salt, to be a testimony and a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a witness of the cross of Christ. And so I encourage you to do that. And, and to pray, and to continue to uh, do everything that uh, uh, the Lord has called us to do, to be a witness to th those that are in fear so that they can come to faith.
in Jesus Christ. I'd like to have you turn to Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. That is our text this evening. As we consider what I call the parable of the wineskins, though uh, it isn't called that in the text here. But nonetheless, Jesus continues his ministry in the Galilee region. It is considered that uh, Jesus and his disciples are still uh, there with Levi or Matthew uh, after the last section of our study last time. when Jesus sat with the publicans and the sinners and was confronted by, by the scribes and the Pharisees. And we find another confrontation in this particular passage, one that brings up the issue of the fast or fasting. And it says in verse 18, of Mark chapter 2, and the disciples of John and of the Pharisees, that, that being John the Baptist, of course, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. Interesting way that it's put there in the King James. It's in the Greek a little bit closer to being, to saying that the disciples of John and the Pharisees were at that very moment fasting. I'll explain it a little bit more about it in a moment. And they come and say unto him, unto Jesus, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filleth it up taketh away, or uh, else the new piece that filleth it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse, or the tear is made worse. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles. Else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilt. The bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. We've heard a lot about change lately. Politicians like to make change their platform. Almost 12 years ago, a little known politician from Illinois named Barack Hussein Obama had become the Democrat Party candidate for President of the United States. In a speech given in Columbia, Missouri on October the 30th, 2008, just days before the election, Obama declared, and I quote, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America, end quote. Their slogan for the 2008 campaign was simply hope and change. Recently, I was reading an article written by Paul Kingor, who I mentioned not long ago as the author of a book that I'm reading right now entitled The Devil and Karl Marx. And uh, I found this article in a website for the National Catholic Register. But I was attracted to it because I saw his name on it, and, and uh, I was actually looking up this phrase, uh, you know, uh, 
based on Obama's speech, fundamentally transforming. And so I, I found this article that Paul, had, uh, Paul Kengor had written. And this is what he writes in that article. There was a, and I quote, there was a full-fledged personality cult in motion at that time. The new president could have promised anything and received a giddy reaction. Obama himself admitted to serving as a kind of blank screen upon which Americans desiring some warm and fuzzy hope and change could project whatever they wanted. But even then, the words fundamentally transform should have alarmed everyone. We Americans generally don't do fundamental transformation. We make changes, yes, small and large, but who among us, other than the most radical revolutionaries, actually want to fundamentally transform the nation?" End quote. Kingor went on to say that uh, after speaking with and reading uh, a number of political scientists and professors in that particular field that most of them would say that totalitarianism is the ideology that fundamentally transforms. Totalitarianism makes you wonder where half of the country is heading today. And much of what we saw in the agenda videos a few weeks ago pointed to the fundamental transformation of this nation during that administration. Now I mention all of that because of this word change. Transformation is a radical change. But it's a change nonetheless. And as much as we are, as much as we hear people calling for change in our country practically in every election cycle. It's interesting that change is one of the hardest things for us to cope with, especially when we're dealing with our deepest held traditions. There are some things that we just won't change. Change sometimes makes us uncomfortable. I would venture to say that more than 75% of people in the, in, in the United States at some point in time would say, I don't like change. Others would say, this is the way I've been all my life and this is the way I'll die. <laughs> well, Jesus was confronted with a question because of a change. Because of a change from the norm. Why do your disciples not fast like we do? Those who confronted Jesus were both the convinced and the curious. The disciples of John were the convinced. John had pointed them to Jesus. The Pharisees were the curious, while at the same time they were the critical, which would make me think that the Pharisees probably made the disciples of John ask the question, because remember, they didn't themselves talk to Jesus directly. They asked the disciples in that last passage that we were reading about why he would eat with publicans and sinners. So we first have to take a look at this confrontation, the confrontation against Jesus here. Verse 18 says, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they come and they say unto him, why, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? Early on in this chapter, Jesus was being confronted by opposition. Scribes reasoned in their hearts against Jesus when he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, confirming his power to forgive, healing the paralytic, asserting his power to heal. 
The next confrontation came when Jesus chose Levi, the tax collector, to follow him, and then made his way to the tax collector's home to attend a party in his honor. How could Jesus associate with such scum? But Jesus replied, if you go back to verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, they that are whole have no need of, a, of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now at a certain level, they should have understood that themselves. But the sad thing was that everybody there that day, except for Jesus, and his disciples probably, but at the time, you could say they were all in need of a physician. All of them. The ones who thought they were righteous and the ones who knew they weren't righteous and needed a, a savior. So again, more than likely during this same gathering, party came the question about fasting. Because according to the law, fasting was commanded only once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which wasn't too long ago in our own calendar. But it was the National Day of Repentance and Forgiveness. We're told in Leviticus 16, verses 30 and 31, for on that day, Shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord? It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And that little phrase, afflict your souls, you shall afflict your souls, came to be understood as by fasting and confession of sin. That's how serious that day was, to fast and to confess their sins. Jewish people today, on the Day of Atonement, will gather and take that time to confess their sins. And yet by Jesus' time, the Pharisees had issued a decree that godly people should fast twice a week on the, six, on the second and fifth days. That would have been on, on Mondays and Thursdays. They would, have, they would have fasted. All was to be solemn on those two days. No joy was to be expressed. Outward appearance was crucial. Whitened faces, ash, ashes on their heads, clothes shoddy, unbathed. Jesus made reference to this in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18, he said, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, Anoint thine head, wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall we reward thee openly. That's how easy we can move from relationship to religion. do things from a religious aspect rather than from the relationship that we have, a relationship that is supposed to be a joyous one with the Lord. And there are times when we pray that we need to be very focused upon the Lord. And at times the Lord places on our hearts to fast. Always necessary, but we make that choice, we make that decision to be clear-headed about the things that we need to hear, clear-hearted as well, to receive from the Lord wisdom, 
grace, understanding. So what Jesus does in this confrontation is he draws some contrasts. In verse 19 of of our text, he says to them, can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles. Else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. To better understand verses 19 and 20, we we consider the contrasts between fasting or feasting, between funerals or weddings. Invited guests attend, attending an ancient Jewish wedding were known as the guests of the bridegroom, or more literally, the children of the bride's chamber. They were exempted from all fasting by rabbinic decree so that the religious observances would not lessen their joy. The wedding was to be a joyous occasion. Now think about this, for those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, there's an even greater reality in all of this. We are the bride of Christ. And the bridegroom is ever with us, always with us. And we are always to be with him. We never leave the bridegroom and he never leaves us. What joy that is to every believer. In this particular instance, you know, we can say, well, we cannot fast because we're with the bridegroom and the bridegroom's with us. And we're enjoying this wedding feast with him. What joy that is to every believer. How can can you not be overjoyed when you hear, for example, Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. Now, this is Old Testament. This is the law. But yet it says in the Lord, it is he that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. He will be with thee. Always. He will not fail thee. Never. And neither forsake thee. Don't think of it. <laughs> Fear not, neither be dismayed. Later on in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, we read, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Wherever you go, he will be with you. How much greater is that truth and that understanding to every believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. I will be with you always. How can that not encourage our our hearts to trust in him now, in this day, in this hour, in this time? Now understand that fasting was not abolished by Jesus, but was put in its proper place. Because as he said in the text itself, he said, while the bridegroom is, you know, that the, can the children of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And we consider when Jesus is taken. 
And the disciples are scattered. His disciples would fast when he was taken away from them, for instance, as Jesus stated. But a passage, for example, found in the prophecy of Isaiah is foundational for the believer's understanding of fasting. I know many books have been written about it. Some are classic books on, on the issue of fasting, but they all point to this passage here in Isaiah 58, verses 6 and 7. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of the wickedness, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. We begin to realize the necessity of clarity in the ministry that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. We may not oftentimes have to fast, or many, many times we do. For example, like we have asked to have you all pray certain days with us to fast for our nation, especially in these days and times in which we're living. And our need to have that clarity as we pray for our president, our pray for our nation, and pray for this upcoming election, which is very soon. It's coming like a whirlwind, you know, I mean, with everything happening, there's not a day goes by that something doesn't happen. Which is also reminding us that the coming of Jesus is very near. But we have to be ready. There are times when we need this focus, this attention, because people still need the Lord. People are still hurting. People are still needy. And no matter what people say about the church today, and whether they want to, you know, criticize us for taking a political stand as we have over the past few weeks, they want to come after us, whatever. We have to deal with him. We have to continue to serve the Lord. Because that's what we're called to do. No matter what, see, no matter who wins the election, here's the thing. Jesus is still on the throne. And we still serve him. And we can still rejoice. Rejoice. But there are times when we need that clarity. Now, from the issue of fasting, and I'm not here to talk about fasting today, but from the issue of fasting, Jesus moved on to the issue of fabrics. When he said in verse 21, no man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment. Else the new piece that filleth it up taketh away from the old, and the rent or the tear is made worse. And what Jesus was saying is that there are fabrics that cannot be interwoven. The new fabric of Christ with the old fibers of religion is what he's really getting at. It might have been considered to mix the best of Pharisaic Judaism with the best of what Christ had to offer, but, but Jesus exposed the folly of that. An old sail patched with a new cloth when exposed to the elements, would have, have a far greater tear because the new cloth would not have been shrunk and would have simply rip apart. And, and let's not forget that they were certainly near the Sea of Galilee and most of the people would have understood what Jesus was getting at, especially the sailors and the fishermen there, when he deals with that very issue. Why would they sew a piece of new cloth together? if it wasn't for their sales. So don't forget that they were so near the sea when Jesus went and 
said to Levi, come follow me. Then Jesus would say in verse 22, and no man putteth new wine into old bottles. Else the new wine doth burst the bottles and the wine is spilled and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. <clears throat> the skins of goats were usually used as wine skins. They were stripped off as whole as possible and partly tanned so that they could be filled with new wine. Because they were naturally elastic and strong, the, the skins were best suited to handle the fermenting new wine, which would cause the skin to expand. The more the wine fermented, the more it would expand. And yet if new wine were put in the old brittle wine skins, the fermentation process would burst the skin and the wine would be lost. The new life that Jesus Christ brings is one that expands and grows and can only do so in new wineskins. New wineskins. Not old wineskins. Once the old wineskin becomes old and brittle, you don't want to put any new wine in it. It will stretch us to new limits and fill every aspect of our lives. But this cannot be done in an old wineskin. Our old selves, the old man, as it were, apart from Jesus Christ, tend to be old wineskins. J.C. Ryle, a contemporary of Charles Spurgeon, has written, how is it with many professing Christians in the present day? We have only to look around and see. There are thousands who are trying to reconcile the service of Christ and the service to the world, to have the name of Christian and yet live a life of the ungodly to keep in with the servants of pleasure and sin and yet be followers of the crucified Christ at the same time? In a word, they are trying to enjoy the new wine and yet cling to the old wineskins. They will find one day that they have attempted what cannot be done. The Galatian churches desire to do this, but Paul would not have it. He introduced this issue to the churches in his letter to them with these words in Galatians 1, verses 6 to 10. And we're not going to go through the whole book, but look at considerable passages here. That we might get an understanding of, of what Jesus was saying about old and new wineskins. In Galatians 1, verse 6, Paul said this, I, I marvel, he said, that ye are, ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, I know that generally speaking, we would say, well, another gospel, a gospel could be just about anything, right? But keep focused here. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he uses the word anathema. Let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. That's a strong statement that Paul is making here. And then he, he goes on, he says, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you that you have received, let him be accursed. Repetition. Saying something twice. 
strong emphasis. These churches were letting in another gospel. And Paul wasn't being easy. Let them be accursed if they bring in another gospel. Then he says, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So that lays the foundation then to where Paul is going in all of this. For in chapter 2, the terms the uncircumcision and the circumcision now are used by Paul to make an even clearer distinction figuratively between new wineskins and old wineskins. He would then write in chapter 2, verse 15 of Galatians, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no man be justified. So now we get a clear sense of who he's speaking about here and who's trying to make another gospel. Verse 17, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. And that is when he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. The emphasis here now, when you put all of that context together is, we must be dead, the old man, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness cometh by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness comes by the law, then I could use my old wineskin anytime I want. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live the old wineskin is crucified. The new wineskin lives. It's a lie. So getting back to Jesus now, the Lord said that he was bringing a new elasticity to life. A new expansion. A new adventure, a new excitement, an altogether new life. The time for the new always comes in both life and history. The day for patching the old will not suffice. And it's not about patching up the old. Too many people have that idea that, you know, I'll, I'll make myself better. When are you going to go to church? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, not, uh, yeah, I'm, not, right, I'm not there yet. Let me, let me make myself better. No, you can't do it. You'll never make yourself better. You're a dried up old brittle wineskin. That's gotta be put away. A new beginning and a new life must be launched or else the person faces uselessness, extinction, extinction or death. Man himself will die in the old garment of his flesh unless he comes to Christ for a new beginning and a new wineskin. And by the way, a wineskin that will never grow old. 
a wineskin that will continue to be filled and expand in the mercies and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we are to struggle in anything, if we are to struggle in anything, we are to struggle against becoming set and fixed in our own ways. Paul would tell the Ephesians in Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 24, he said, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, the worthlessness, uselessness, and emptiness of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, Lasciviousness has to do with lust. But you have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Christ or in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, the old wineskin, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, the new wineskin, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. By the way, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. And he has covered us in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And lastly, and I know it's early, it's early, wow. That's okay, sometimes it happens, huh? Colossians 3, verses nine through 11. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Remember that you're no longer an old wineskin. And have put on the new man. Literally, it says you've put on the new, the new wineskin, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, Circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Christ is all. And so Jesus, in a very brief statement, brings to those detractors and critics the proper way of seeing the law and the prophets and the word of God and the intention that God has always had in his word. Man is a sinner. Man has sinned from the beginning. And yet since the beginning of that time, God has made a way. God promised a savior. He promised a Messiah, a redeemer. And his name is Jesus. And he's the only begotten Son of God. The most unique of all because he is without sin. And was without sin when he was on this earth. 
and will always be without sin. That is what makes him unique. And that knowledge cannot be held in the old wineskin. The old wineskin of our lives of our sinful flesh, of our sinful nature. Does the enemy work on us every day? Works overtime to get us off the beaten track, to get us looking at the world, to get us looking at fear, to get us looking at all kinds of things that the Lord has already always said. Just come to me. I'll give you rest. Be strong in the Lord, in the power of his mind. I'll give you everything that you need for life and for godliness. It's a battle. It's a battle. But let's remember, the bridegroom is always with us. And he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So draw near to Jesus. Every time there is that temptation, every time there is that battle, every time there is that drawing, and then the enemy draws hard. He draws us hard with so many things. And I'll tell you what, the, te the technologies that we carry with us every day, are, are vessels that he tries to use. But we don't have to succumb to them. We just need to remember who we are in Christ. You're a new wineskin. And continue to f be filled with the wonders of his mercies and his grace, his truth, his love. And know that he's coming soon. That in itself should be what encourages our hearts. That he's coming soon. And then we will be with him forever and ever. Thank you, Lord, for your word this evening. I pray, Father, that you will strengthen us, Lord, and encourage our hearts to remember everything that Jesus has done for us, everything that he continues to do in our lives. And I would ask, Father, that we would take the time to Meditate upon these things throughout this week to remember the importance of, of the new man, of the new person that you have made us in your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless us, Lord, as we face the trials and the temptations, as we face the challenges of this coming week. Even today, they might even raise their heads before we even get to the new week. So we entrust ourselves to you, Lord. We pray, Father, that you'll fill us with every goodness, with every mercy, with every truth, and with every word that proceeds out of your mouth. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Shall we stand? Yeah, don't get used to the time. Sometimes anomalies happen. <laughs> the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee shalom, give thee peace.
Have a blessed, blessed evening. And uh, continue to trust in the Lord. And pray for this upcoming election. Pray that God gives you wisdom. If you haven't voted yet, these guides are out on the, on the back. The guys will have some out there if you need one. Uh, if you already have voted, praise the Lord. Some of us have, and we just uh, encourage you to do that, which God has given us the opportunity to do in this time. And it's a very serious time. Very serious time. So, may God richly bless you after the song. If you need prayer, please feel free to come on up to the front here. God bless you all.